Hello, everybody, and welcome in to this edition of the Odds and Audibles podcast. It is Wednesday, September 4th. I forgot the date, so I had to look at the, uh, my computer over here. It's all just kind of been a whirlwind recently. So, But it's Wednesday, which means that we're going to be kind of going over some of the storylines going into this upcoming game for the Ducks, number seven in the country. They're taking on 1-0 Boise State. Boise State had a nice High scoring victory over Georgia Southern in their first week of the season. Both these teams will be 1 0 going into the week. Um, this was one of the most highly profiled games on Oregon's schedule going into the season. It's still there just because Boise State was a pretty favorable pick for the group of five college football playoff potential appearance. And here it is in front of us, uh, starting at 7 p.m. this Saturday, September 7th, streaming only on Peacock. For those not familiar, you have to sign up for Peacock to watch this game. You cannot watch it on cable or anywhere else. This is a Peacock-only game. I just thought that that should be one of the bigger broadcasts and one of the points that we should emphasize this week for those who are unfamiliar with how to get Peacock. Just go to NBC, Peacock, look that up on Google. You'll be just fine. But today... Like I said, going over some storylines. So, Eric, what do, what do we want to talk about first here? Well, I'll just build off that last thing. It's been a weird start to a season for Oregon where the first two weeks there's like yeah. straight, kind of just a little abnormality with the, with the broadcast, whether it was Comcast, like not allowing anybody to watch this last game mm-hmm. in the Big Ten Network, or now with Peacock. So maybe this plays in Oregon's favor where like a big part of the country won't have watched Oregon play for a couple of weeks and they kind of get the rust out. Not that they're ignoring the number three team now, number seven in the polls mm-hmm. uh, who played very poorly in their first game. Not that they'd be ignoring them, but maybe that's not the worst thing in the world to a certain degree. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> of all weeks to maybe not be seen by most people on television, the uh, week one against Idaho is probably the best one to have. Agreed. Um, Storylines. Let's start with just like, Oregon health. I think this is, I know sure. some, some fans don't love when we sp- devote time to this, but just who's going to be on the field? Who do we not think will be on the field? I think it's just a good place to start. Big names first. Uh, Jeff Boss and Justin Jacobs played 17 snaps on Saturday against Idaho. Don't have full explanation for why. Sure looks this week like they're both fine and they're going to play. Um, I don't really have any indication that they aren't going to play or that's going to be limited. We also didn't have any of that last week. So excuse me if they come out and once again play less than 20 combined snaps i just don't think that's going to happen especially as we'll get to on the show entering a game with a player as good as ashton genty um i think you want you need to have frankly all of your top dogs especially at linebacker available for this one i think oregon will um and then the two big ones that missed the first game that i thought were notable and that dan has conveyed at least some optimism for matthew bedford the projected starting right guard um, and then Gary Bryant Jr., who started it last year at receiver, who I think this year is probably more of a reserve, but still an important part of this offense. Dan, on Monday, I asked him, it was a yes or no question. I got three words. I got a, an affirmative answer about if he was optimistic about them playing mm-hmm. practice this week. Really kind of hard to know, but they're both in cleats and they're both doing some stuff. Today, earlier uh, on Wednesday, we got to catch the, f- the final open practice of the week. Gary Bryant, field and punts. Matt Bedford. Yep. Doing work under the shoot. About all we got. Seems like that's good stuff. I have no idea what that'll mean for Saturday. Dan was again asked about Bedford following the practice. Gave a very canned answer of just like, yeah, I think I think there's a chance he'll play. So we'll see on Saturday. But I think certainly those are two names to kind of keep an eye out for. And then the guys that we just are pretty clearly not going to see, I think, remain Dave Iuli, Julio Florence. A couple of yeah. other guys who are out for there. You think there might be a Julio or Dave? Pr- Lawrence exciting? was full participant in Mod Bracket. And for those who don't know what Mod yeah. Bracket, it's okay. a drill that we get to watch where the, basically Oregon works on perimeter tackling. It is full-fledged, full pads, full contact. Lawrence had two reps that what we were able to see and was full contact, full go. So I agree. I don't think he's going to play. However, that was better than it was you know, pre-week one. So he's clearly making improvements. But... I think it's a higher it's a higher percentage than maybe we think. But then again, do you want to put them in the game against Boise State? As a whole different question. When you we still haven't seen Cam Alexander. Well, I was just going to say, corner is such a weird position to assess right now because Jaleel is whatever, and I, I think we at some point can have a bigger question. Like if this is a thing that carries on further into the season, I, I start to wonder what's really going on here because he was supposedly getting close to be back in. April, <laughs> according to Chris right. Hampton. And yeah. we're here in 
early September and we're still talking about it. So, but you're right. I mean, like Cam Alexander, do we think he's going to play? I think that's another question. He, we, we, he's been available the whole, all the way through fall. All fall. Yeah. And yet he didn't play a down. And this is a guy who again was projected to be a starting corner. So there's certainly like some kind of interesting dynamics there, but I still would lean I feel more confident that Ayuli won't play just because he was he wasn't even in cleats. I think yesterday, um, Jaleel I guess maybe has a better chance of playing. I just am at this point so skeptical and like kind of mystified by what's going on there sure. that I just I just don't want to say we think it's going to happen. But if it does happen, that would be certainly um, in, you know an important development for Saturday. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I want to go back to Justin and Jeffrey for a second. Um, Jeff very clearly hurt on the first one of the first two drives of the game um just a he went up made a tackle in the hole and the hole kind of got bent back to his right and his right leg bent underneath himself so it was looked pretty bad when re-watching the game but uh he's been full go in practice uh looks like that he's suited up and ready to go so i think that's a positive thing i do not think he'll play the 10 snaps he did like he did last week and then justin i don't really have an explanation there part of my brain is telling me that Oregon wants to keep Jeff and Justin together, but that just wouldn't work because they started Bryce with Jeff. So I don't yeah. really know what that's about. Um, could be injury related, could not be, could be, um, you know, game by game oriented what the opposing offense does. So maybe we'll see him more on the field this week because it's a run heavy team in Boise State or predominantly run heavy, which we'll get to in a second, but not really sure what's going on there. And then uh, for Bedford, I don't know. Sounds like sounds pretty good. Um, last week was pretty promising that he was at practice and then suited up for the game. That just goes into a larger discussion of what the offensive line is going to look like, which I think we've hashed out a couple of times on this yeah. podcast by now of what happens when he comes back. So I won't get back into it, but it will be nice to see him play. I think that will certainly help solidify some of the offensive line issues. But, um, you know, by all accounts, it sounds pretty positive on his end. Will he play? You know, we'll find out on Saturday, but I think it sounds pretty good. It does. And one last thing on injuries before we move on to some more thoughts on this game. For those who are unfamiliar, the Big Ten requires there to be updates on injuries. So expect those about 5 p.m. I think it's two hours prior to kickoff. Oregon has to mm -hmm. designate questionable or out um, for players that are, are dealing with injuries. So um, you will have a little bit more awareness, I guess, of the details of this a couple hours before kickoff on Saturday. So keep, keep kind of keep an eye on for that one if you're if you're intrigued about who's available because we'll we'll be able to at least report who's on that list and, and what the designation is. Well let's uh I guess we can talk about the game or something yeah, like that on this uh, observation observation storyline podcast. Uh Boise State, like I said, one and oh this season had a nice high scoring win against Georgia Southern. Uh the main superstar of that game, Ashton Genty 267 yards on the ground and six touchdowns. Um, he is the <laughs> he is the goal to stop for a lot of the Oregon defenders, for all of the Oregon defenders, excuse me. That will be, you know, kind of the deciding factor. I think we should spend time just on mm -hmm. how good of a player Ashton Genty is and what it's going to take from Oregon's defensive front, specifically their front seven, to kind of bring him down. Yeah, this is the story of the game. I mean, if, if we're being honest, I don't think Boise, and we can get to it, they have some talent on the outside. I don't think their quarterback is bad by any means, but their bread is buttered with their running backs. And Janty is as good of a back Oregon will see this year. We've talked about this many times. Ohio State has a great backfield as well, and I'm sure we'll rival this, but Genty's awesome. Um, we should even note, like, I, I want to. I hope I get the name right here. Is it Sire Gaines? Is the true freshman running back who came in and also ran for 110 I think so, yards? Yeah. Um, they kind of got a, they got a couple dynamic guys. I know we had um, BJ Reigns of Bronco Nation News on our podcast on Tuesday, and, and there's a, another running back who's I think a sophomore whose name is very strange. Um, I don't want to butcher it, but uh, he, he it seems, is also going to be involved in this offense eventually. I don't know if it's clear if it's this week or not, but this is a really powerful run offense, but it starts with, and ends with Genty, to be, to be fair. Um, really dynamic body type. I think he's like 5'9", 215, and just built, for lack of a better word, like a brick shit house. Like he's just He looks like what an NFL running back looks like. Like mm -hmm. even going and even look kind of even further, like he looks like some of these Boise State 
running backs of the past, whether it was like a, a Doug Martin or a Alexander Madison, like some of these backs that are just really stoutly physically built. Um, yeah. And he's a total bell cow. And I think the thing that's, you know, clear watching and then also kind of looking at what he's done at Boise the last couple of years is great between the tackles can finish runs. He had a couple to 275 plus yard runs in mixed in there for touchdowns against Georgia Southern. That's real mm-hmm. good. Oregon didn't have a Oregon didn't have a run play of more than 16 yards last game. Yep. So mm-hmm. context. Um, and then the thing that Dan has brought up a couple of times is the stiff arm, which I'm. Yeah. Every time we've talked about him, Dan has brought that up. I'm now like glued to like, okay, let's, I want to see the stiff arm. Cause Dan talks about how it's like kind of a rare breed. I don't know if that's totally accurate, but like people don't, there aren't a lot of guys who do it really well. Yeah. It sounds like Ashton, somebody that at least Dan has observed is like, he, he can bring it with that stiff arm. So i um, curious to watch that. And then, to the Oregon defensive part, and I'll toss it to you because I know you spoke to a couple of guys today about it, but like the positive for your Oregon is you go back to the Idaho game, and the, I would say the part of the entire team that was most impressive was that defensive front, like mm-hmm. bar none. Like Derek Harmon yeah. is a stud. Mateo looked great coming off the edge. Jamari Caldwell didn't post any stats, but he had a great game. Jordan Birch was awesome. Um, Tatum Tuioti set up a couple of sacks. He didn't get a lot of credit for it, but like, they had a lot of, um, and you can probably jump in if there's anybody else that that you thought really had an outstanding game. But I, when I rewatched it and kind of focused on the defense in particular, I was like, this defensive front is outstanding, and like maybe one mm-hmm. of the better ones we've seen Oregon produce in a while. Like I don't know, like I can't think of a defensive front that's had this many kind of dynamic guys, to be honest. So if you want to get glass half full, it would be Boise State's biggest strength on offense happens to also be probably Oregon's biggest strength on defense. And so that's where I think you can be optimistic, but optimistic when going against a running back who just ran for 260 yards and six touchdowns, it doesn't mean you think you're going to shut him down by any means. Yeah. On, on 20 carries as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's, that's pretty important. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. No, Oregon's defensive front is, is really good. And, they performed against Idaho as you would expect a team with this type of defensive front to like against an FCS opponent. Um, but they're going to have a tough matchup this week. Like Boise State's offensive line is really darn good. And I, you know, I believe that a running back is only as good as his offensive line. I know that could be, you know, kind of a bad take to some people like that, that, you know, running backs can be like as good as they can, but unless they don't, unless they have a hole to run through, they're not going to be that good. And, that's going to be the important part for Oregon's defense uh, with Harmon, with Caldwell, especially those two guys in the middle of the line, just trying to plug up A, B, C gaps. Um, you know, Harmon last week was just diabolical. Like his PFF grades were great. He had, you know, five or six pressures, I think, which tied with Mateo for the lead. Um, and I didn't really talk to him too much, but I did talk to Jamari Caldwell a lot about Ashton Genty and just what it's going to take. And he had some interesting quotes about Genty. Um, he compared him in terms of his physicality, Genty's physicality, to Ollie Gordon, who he played last year in the Big 12. And mm. if you're unfamiliar with Ollie Gordon, uh, best running back in the country, just bar none. Like you, I, I and, he, and he really was the good, but he, he was the Doak Walker Award winner, which goes to the best running back. So that's not hyperbole. He, no, he is quite good. Going to be a round one pick as a running back, which is uh, kind of rare. Sometimes it's you know happens a lot, but um, he's going to be a darn good running back in the NFL. You're going to hear his name for years to come, Ollie Gordon, and probably Ash and Genty eventually. So he compared his physicality to Ollie Gordon's, and then compared his speed to he said a TCU running back. Couldn't remember his name. I looked it up. Amani Bailey last year, Houston played them, played TCU. Bailey ran for 126 yards on 23 carries and a touchdown. So I'm not overly familiar with uh, Amani Bailey's game, but that's still a pretty darn good stat line by all things considered. Um, and they basically, Harmon, Eric, you talked to him more than I did because I was over with Jamari, but I think they both basically said the goal is to, is obviously just to stop the run. And they have to do these, me personally, they have to do these, yeah, they have to stop the run on first and second down. They cannot let let Boise State go to third and fourth and short, where they are very elite at, because they have a good offensive line, because they have Genty as a running back, where third and fourth and one really isn't that big of a deal. And that's kind of how Oregon has been in the past couple of years with Dan, even though I know the fourth down decisions, whatever. Usually, 
if things are executed well, those are pretty easy yards to gain for Jordan James, Bucky Irving, Noah Whittington. That's how Boise State operates this year. So it's going to be imperative for guys up front like Harmon, like Caldwell, Amari Washington, Keon Ware Hudson, and anybody else who plays to limit what they can do on first and second down. Because if you get Maddox Madsen to throw the football, that's a way better outcome than seeing Ashton Genty run for 200 yards in Hudson Stadium. Seven of 11 Boise was on third down in the opener against Georgia Southern. When they get that stat out there, uh, Jared's right. They excelled in that range. Um, and then Derek Harmon, kind of to the broader point here, de- delivered a really funny line today when he was asked about uh, Maddox Madsen, the quarterback for Boise State. And he asked, what does he do well? And his first response was, he hands the ball off to the running back, which sounds like a slight. And even even Derek kind of backed off initially or, or uh, eventually because I think he kind of went, oh, that kind of sounds wrong. But his point is like, what we talked about this offense starts and ends with the run game and the quarterback's biggest value here is to protect the football and give it to these dynamic running backs and kind of get out of the way. And so that's not to say um, Maddox Madsen can't beat Oregon on a couple passes downfield. And they've certainly got right. receivers that are, are notable in terms of like guys that are big and athletic and Chris Marshall. I don't know how much he'll be involved, but there's a former five-star recruit. He was actually ranked right behind Evan Stewart in that recruiting class, and they both started their careers out at Texas A&M. Uh, Marshall's had, I think, some disciplinary issues, was kicked out of a couple of programs, ended up at junior college last year, was the top junior college player of the year um, mm-hmm. by 24-7, and now he's at, at Boise. So there's there's some interesting skill talent on the outside, to be, to be clear, but nobody should be mistaken for what they're going to try to do here, which is to run the football and run the football over and over again with a lot of success. So Again, I think Oregon has a, a defense built to try to stop an offense like this, but we'll see. I mean, they thought that I thought they played really well, but it's it's Idaho and this is Boise State. And I think you'll be really disappointed, I would say, coming out of this game, even in a victory, if the defensive line struggles mightily and you come out going like, are we good on either side of the ball in the trenches or are we like bad offensive line, bad defensive line? I don't think we'll come out saying that, but this is a game where that'll be tested in a way where you could come out going like, well, if this is a preview for what Ohio State's going to look like, we might have some problems. Yeah, 100%. And to go back on Madsen, like last year he played a good amount of the games. I can't remember. Buchanan was the quarterback beforehand at, uh, at Boise State. I can't remember his name. He, he's now transferred. Was it Buchanan? Right. I thought that was the year before. I think it's a different quarterback. You can look that up. I'll look it up because you were, you were gone there. Sure. And last year, Madsen completed 61% of his passes for just under 1,200 yards, nine touchdowns, three interceptions, uh, like a nine-yard average. So he's not the best quarterback in the world, but he certainly can do damage. And like Dan said, I think on Monday that Boise State likes to run a lot of play action because of how good their running game is, and he does a good job with that. So it's, it's that Oregon just has to play sound defense. At the end of the day, they have to stop the runs on first and second down, limit them to third and long and try to get off the field. And if they can get in a third and long, I like their chances. Uh, Taylor Green was the quarterback last year. He's now at Arkansas where he is their starting quarterback. Uh, I think Buchanan left Buchanan left the year before to go to Notre Dame, I think. Is that right? Anyway, Boise State quarterbacks. If we have Boise State listeners are probably like cringe. These guys don't know their their Bronco guys, quarterbacks. Which we do. Um, don't worry. Which we do. Uh you know, and so let's let's turn now to Bachmeyer. The others. Bachmeyer, Hank, yes, big Hank. That was it. My bad. He's at um, Wake now. Okay, gosh, uh, yeah, we really did fumble some there. Um, Louisiana Bachmeyer, Tech last year. Yeah. Okay, Bachmeyer is who who his uh, younger brother we watched at uh, SNL last year, and I think uh, is uh, as a quarterback at like yes. Stanford or something. Um, let's turn to like the defense for Boise State and some takeaway or some kind of things to watch there. Yeah. And then maybe we can finish. I know later on today on Duck Territory, we're going to post our like biggest storylines going into the game. And maybe we can kind of recap some of that, which I think will probably overlap a little bit, at least for me, with this discussion. Mm-hmm. Um, Boise State's really disruptive. Yes. Like They had two guys last year with more than 16 tackles for loss each, not combined. They had two guys who combined for 32 and a half tackles for loss, and they're both back this year. Um I previewed trying to say this name in the pre with Jared. Uh, Ahmed Hassanine, uh is the defensive end. I don't know if I nailed that. I apologize to uh, 
the Boise State fan base. And then Andrew Simpson is the linebacker who really emerged last year, kind of a breakout player. Both mm-hmm. those guys are very dynamic. Um, Simpson's a guy who I think you'll see all over the place. Like he's kind of a Devin Jackson y type in terms of like he's just really explosive, makes a lot of plays. I know Devin hasn't done quite that at Oregon, but I'm just talking about like fit and athletic tools. Um, Simpson was like number three on the team in tackles last year. I already mentioned the tackle for loss total. He had like six and a half sacks. I think he forced four fumbles. He had a couple of picks. He has two forced fumbles already this year. Like this is just a playmaker to be aware of and probably one of the better linebackers we're going to face certainly in the first half of the season. Um, So there's a couple of players here to know about. They're pretty good in the front seven, similar to Oregon. I think the back end is real iffy. And you saw that last week where Georgia Southern put up some pretty impressive passing figures against that defense. Um, I think over 300 yards passing and several, several touchdowns. So, um, you know, if you want to get turn this around and kind of like what's the key for Oregon, it's continue to be able to hopefully find those short intermediate routes. But maybe you can actually beat these guys over the top like you couldn't last week against Idaho. Certainly Georgia Southern didn't do a great job of keeping everything in front of uh, – Boys Boise didn't do a great job of keeping everything in front of them against Georgia Southern. So I think there's an opportunity there. I, I'm going to be curious to see what this run game looks like because this is a good front for Boise State. They're not – humongous but neither was idaho and they've got some real athletic um some real athleticism coming off the edge yeah georgia southern ran for 139 yards last last week which more than oregon did against idaho um so maybe there is some hope that oregon can get it going but that was on 35 rush attempts Mm that's not necessarily the best they did have four rushing touchdowns because a lot of the times um you know they threw the ball 50 times against boise state but they got down to like the one yard line, two yard line, three yard line, and they just ran it in. So that could be the direction that Oregon goes. But uh, like you said, they're really disruptive off the edges. Like it could be another situation where uh, a, a opposing defensive line can get to Dylan Gabriel because they have real talent on the edges. Like Hassan is probably going to be, you know, a top three round draft pick. Um, just with his production, like you said, 16 tackles for the last 12 and a half sacks last season. Uh, yeah. They had four sacks against Georgia State, uh, excuse me, Georgia Southern. Obviously, they were dropping back 50 times, so there's more opportunities to get those sacks, get those tackles for loss. So that certainly helps, but that's it's indicative of how well of a pass rush that they have. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is a huge week for Oregon's offensive line. You know, we thought it was pretty poor last week against Idaho where Dylan Gabriel was sacked. And granted, it was. There were certainly some bad moments, which Dan said that everything is uh, everything can be corrected. Everything is fixable in like a week because that's the job of the coach. And it's like, cool, let's see it. We'd love, we'd love to find out if it's just execution errors, which I think a lot of them were, yeah. or if it's just uh, the lack of continuity between the offensive linemen. So. We'll see. This is certainly going to be a challenge. I don't think, again, this is why you know I started off with the show by saying Boise State was a really popular pick for the group of five at large in the college football playoffs. Like This team has real legit bona fide NFL talent at important positions like defensive end, like running back, like some wide receiver. Like They have a lot of height on their wide receiver roster. Mm-hmm. Like There's real talent here, and it's not going to be like Idaho where – I know it's an FCS talent for sure, but it shouldn't really compete with Oregon. Like this is a game where Boise State could certainly compete with Oregon if they can get a pass rush, if they can run the ball effectively. And, and you know, it'll, for them, it'll all start defensively. And for Oregon, on the flip side, they got to start throwing the ball. Yeah, because if they can start throwing the ball and throwing a deep 15, 20, 30 yards down the field, you know, that's going to call off the dogs for Boise State. And uh, I can't remember if Dan said that they're pretty multiple on defense. I think he did on Monday where they like run a bunch of different stuff, but it's another tough thing to prepare for. And if you're Dylan Gabriel, I think you got to be just better at making your reads pre-snap and figuring out motions and figuring out what the defense is going to do. Because uh, if they can, if Boise State can get an effective pass rush early on in the game, this could be another close one in Odson. Definitely. Right. And like, if you talk about it, like best case for Boise, they run the hell out of the ball and they make Dylan's life really difficult and he can't throw the ball effectively. And Oregon Mm -hmm. continues to kind of be iffy on the run. That's a recipe for a Boise state upset. Right. And like, I I don't think any of us think that's going to be the outcome 
Oregon's still what, 18, 19 point favorites last I saw. Um, I know Jared probably a little more dialed in on that. Uh, yeah, around there. S- somewhere around there. So th- there's still a lot of confidence Oregon's going to win this game and win decisively. But I do think there's a lot of things that have to improve. And, you know, my biggest storyline, I don't know if Jared, if you've gotten into yours or not yet, because I haven't actually seen what our, both our selections were, but I hate to say it, but I'm just still fixed on that offensive line. Like you, you've mm-hmm. got to be better there. And whether Bedford returns or not, and I don't think Bedford returning just fixes everything. I don't think it's as simple as, oh yeah, you've got your five guys you wanted to start. And now this is working like clockwork and everything looks seamless and, and they just dominate and they're back to being, you know, Joe Moore award finalist offensive line. But, you know, so almost regardless of which guys are out there, you've got to see better continuity. You can't have your all American preseason right tackle misaligned twice. You can't be seeing yeah. false starts and holds in crucial spots. I thought the hold was iffy ish, actually, but whatever. Um, and you've got to be, I, I just think like, you can't get beaten one on one as much as we saw. Like that was the other thing against Idaho. Is like it wasn't all just like oh they they didn't have, you know, there were pre snap issues and they weren't aligned properly. But no, there were times where Oregon's guys just kind of got beat like head up. Mm-hmm. And hundred percent. Boise State has players that are better than those Idaho players, and we've already highlighted a couple of them. But like, you'd like to think a Johnny can protect that blind side and keep Hassanen from coming out and, and finishing with a couple of sacks, but. We just saw him struggle against lesser pass rusher a week ago, right? You know, not throughout the game entirely, but on one rep specifically that led to a strip sack and a turnover. So I I think it's imperative you see better play there and better play from all five because it wasn't just like, oh, Pickard and Poncho are new starters. They really had a tough game. It was like, no, there were pretty rough rough moments for kind of just about everybody in that unit. So, um, Mm -hmm. hey, I hate that for a second week. That's where my focus is or my main storyline is, but – I think I'd be lying if I didn't say I thought that was not only the most important thing for this week because of some of the things we talked about with Boise and, and with their ability to maybe take advantage of some places where Oregon's susceptible, but also long term because you play Ohio State and Michigan and then some of these, you know, tier down or a couple tiers down boy, Big Ten teams, you're going to have a really, really hard time being successful in those football games. So I think you need to see real market improvement um, along the offensive line this week. Yeah, hundred percent. I haven't put my pick in for most important, but it might be like limiting what Hassanen could do because that's going to be, um, that's going to be real imperative because giving Dylan Gabe real time is what makes this offense click. It's what gets receivers open down the field. It gives them the opportunity to actually throw down the field. Um, I think I think my ultimate storyline going in the game is just can Oregon's defensive line stop Genty and first and second down situations and produce multiple like third and six or, you know, heaven forbid that there's a a first down loss and it's like a third and 12, like those, that, that needs to be the, I I think that'll be like the biggest storyline in my eyes, just because you can make Boise state have to throw the ball. I, I think that's a much better situation. I don't think that Boise state's receivers are, um, I just don't think that it's a better matchup for them. I think Oregon's secondary, despite who's going to be playing, is it Dante or Cam or is it Jaleel? Like they're still going to have Jabbar Muhammad on whoever is the best receiver. They still have Kobe Savage, still have Brandon Johnson. They still have Taishim Johnson, assuming he plays in the first half. Like that's still a much a much better unit. It's still one of the best units on the field at all times, no matter who they're playing. And if you can get them in a third down and long situations, I feel a lot better about it. Um, you know, that being said, Oregon is just a much better team top to bottom than Boise State. Like, I know that this may sound like rain on the parade or anything like that, but these are, you know, some legitimate concerns. These are real things that we saw last week that if they come into fruition again, could be another close one. Like I said earlier, like these are, and, and also, like I said, like Boise State has good talent at edge spots at linebacker spots like things that gave oregon fits a week ago so i don't know a lot of things to look forward to in this game um and you know i I do think that oregon comes out in place with their hair on fire like we've kind of seen that this week during practice and some of the press conferences afterwards yeah i was just gonna say i had two things one was i thought it was notable after the game 
and Dylan didn't really want to get into detail, but said a couple times, like the practice has to look a certain way. And it was pretty clear he was saying it hadn't. But then yesterday on Tuesday, when we spoke with him, he said there were really fiery practices. And you could just tell he was like pretty pleased with what he'd seen out there. And again, mm-hmm. I don't want to read too much <laughs> into a player talking about a practice that we really didn't get to see much from. But it does it does seem like there's been an uptick or a, a different level of focus or whatever was absent there. It seems like some of that's been corrected, which is really encouraging. Yeah. But yeah, it's all like, it's all just also like they're talking to us. You're not going to be like, oh, we actually our practices have been terrible. Like, that's not what I'm expecting. Of either. course. No, they would never. You know, they, they're always going to say that they're good no matter what. Um, I, I just like from the brief things that we get to see, it did feel like it was a little bit more uh intense like on tuesday in that practice i thought the mod bracket drill which is usually pretty intense was a little bit higher like there were some real thuds going on like nico reed laid somebody out i don't remember who the running back was but full-on just like stop dead in your tracks shoulder down into their chest like in the middle of practice and today even during special teams like i was watching the punters it it was loud it was a lot of yelling it felt like yeah I don't know, like just trying to sit there and like, oh, I'm here to watch the punters. And then Chris Hampton is going at people and like the the kickoff return unit. And it just the music was blaring. It just felt like it was a step above an in intensity. And I know every Oregon fan is going to love to hear that. But um, I do think that with how good of a motivator a lot of the people on the staff are, including Dan, including Tosh, like I think that like Oregon should come out with their hair on fire. But you know, they they lost a lot last week. They lost some credibility about how good of a team they are. Do they deserve to be top 10? Do they deserve to be top 5? Like, oh, they don't deserve to be top 5 anymore cuz they're now they're not. They're number 7 in the country, number 6 in the coaches poll. So, I think they have a lot to prove uh and I think that they're ultimately going to prove it. I just think that the things we've talked over today are some real potential downfalls or maybe not downfalls it's a little yeah. dramatic but some real like little little chips in the chips in the wall chips in the armor whatever you want to talk about like it's these are Can problems I, that will arise multiple times this year if not figured out and can i present one more yeah of course let's hear it how do you feel about place kicking golly um <laughs> what do you mean how i feel it's shit <laughs> it's well shit for years i mean but like i i like you that's a great answer um it, it's been bad in practice and then they missed a, i know it's a 51 yard or whatever it's a long yeah. kick. like i'm not gonna expect atticus to come out here and drill everything but he was nicknamed automaticus and then missed his first try which was a little bit of irony to that. But it wasn't even close. That's no. the problem and, with these. And the, and the other problem is we've now watched three straight weeks where they've done at least one day of pressure kicks. And I don't think there's been a day where they've been clean. I think and pressure kicks. No, clear, one, per, somebody's one person missed. has missed every time. And yesterday on Tuesday, and again, just to take a step back, what pressure kicks are is, is they basically have the entire team surrounding them. They run like a like a foghorn going over the, yeah. the loudspeaker. Players are jumping. They're trying to simulate like a real environment. And they have had the top kicker and the second kicker. And it's been Atticus and Gage Hurich rotating. But one of those two has kicked every time. And between them, they've missed about 50% of them. And on Tuesday, yeah. they both missed. And the first one was from Atticus. And it was like real left. I mean, not 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 just a little bit, but real left. So, again, I, don't want, I know fan, Oregon fans probably feel like Jared in terms of it's always shit because that's – not an inaccurate representation of the history of Oregon kicking, I mean, with the exception the of like last a couple of four, good seasons. <laughs> yeah, but. in the last four or five years, like when has somebody lined up for a field goal where you're like, like over thirty yards, my uh, over twenty five yards, mind you, that you've been like, yeah, no, this is this is it. Fine, I'm just gonna start writing my tweet that whomever it was, whomstever it was, made this field goal. When when did that happen? Even Camden, Camden's year where he was like 80%, I still was like, love the kid, really fun to talk to. I was still kind of like, I don't know how I feel about this. So yeah. it's it, oh. it doesn't it doesn't feel much better right now is, I guess, the point to bring up. And I hope we pro- we're proven wrong. And I hope Atticus just goes on out there and makes every kick the rest of the year. Uh, but great. in practice, it's been real mi- – it's real mixed, to be honest. And then in the games – he tried one and he didn't. He did. Oh, he tried two, and but he missed one of them. So um, yeah, kickoffs look good. 
that is a positive. Kickoffs look really good. Um, so that's something to take away. But yeah, place kicking, we were talking about this, uh, I think it was yesterday, where it's just like, go out. Like you have all the, Oregon, presumably, uh, definitely, excuse me, has all of this NIL money. Save a hundred grand, <laughs> save 200 grand and go find the best kicker in the country and go steal him from whatever school. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> go for it. It would help tremendously in your adventures and trying to win a national championship. And, and that's the other part is we're just, just believing in last year. There was a certain kick that if Camden had made the season might've gone a teensy bit differently, but anyway, um, yeah, he's going to make all his kicks this weekend. I, I promise. Yeah. My, my prediction is that he doesn't have to kick. That'd probably be a good outcome. Oh, we're going to scoring zero points. Sorry. <laughs> oh, geez. That was... <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. I think, I think they're going to figure out that he doesn't have to kick this week. Yeah. That's my All prediction, right. but we'll see all of these things that we just talked about today, including place kicking on Saturday, starting at 7 PM only on Peacock. Remember only on Peacock. You cannot watch this on Comcast, direct TV, whatever it is. You have to sign up for Peacock. And if you already have Peacock, go to the big 10 channel on Peacock and you'll be able to find it. But that starts at 7 PM, Oregon and, and Boise State, both teams one and zero, oh. and uh, yeah, I think that's going to do it from us here at the Odds and Audibles podcast. Thank you for listening. If you're still listening after our darn place kicking rant, um, if you are, please leave a five star review wherever you're listening: Apple Podcasts, Spotify, whatever the case is. Uh, and yeah, that'll do it for me and Eric Scopel. We'll see you later, guys. Talk to you later, folks. Peace.